Excellent. Does anybody have any questions from last week, last class, any topics? Anything at all? The lyrics are due today. Any date, any time this date. So midnight is one second too late. So first I wanted to highlight a few student submissions from the exercise that I asked you to accomplish. I gave a new uh, sequence alignment of a few genes from a few different, or one gene from a few different species and asked you to draw me a tree and submit those by yesterday, I believe. These are three results. So we've got the one here on the upper left. We've got one in the upper right, and we've got one in the bottom. So one through three. So your first job is to compare these. Do they all say the same thing, and which one is correct? Structure of the tree is what to look at. So they all come up with the same answer? Who are the sister species? A and C are always most closely related. So they share, in this case, the most recent common ancestor. Same there. Same there. So in all three cases. And the branch lengths were all reported to be the same, except for number three. So what's different about? Three and is its branch, are its branch lengths right or wrong? Right, technically they're still the same. So you could redraw this tree with that 1.5 unit branch going that direction, and then it looks the same as all the other trees total of two. So it doesn't matter which structure the tree is drawn in. These are all unrooted trees, but exactly the same response. And that was the answer. So these distance matrices are all accurate, and the trees are all accurate based on the distance matrices. Just a little bit of feedback for you about the solution to that question. That just about wraps up the formal instruction on phylogenetics. So we'll talk about phylogenetic trees a lot more as we go through the term because they're essential for evolution, but we'll just have little bits and pieces here and there. So if you have any final questions about phylogenetics, drawing trees, now is the time. Otherwise, we move right into molecular genetics. And I realized that actually what I prepared for today has nothing to do with molecular genetics. So um, I have. The Red Queen Hypothesis. So we're starting to get towards the exam, so it's worth. So all of those trees would be in effect? That's correct, yes. All of these trees represent the same structure of tree, even though this one in the bottom was drawn in a different fashion. They're all unrooted trees. This one's drawn in cladogram format, where all of the species wind up on the same edge of the tree. But the, to the important point is the total branch lengths between each two branch tips are the same. So for example, from A to B, it was 1 plus a half plus a half. So A to B is 3, which was what was in the table. And I also don't mind if you draw that style of tree as a branching tree as opposed to the type that has more brackets, the squared off brackets. It doesn't matter. Either of those is fine. Other questions? Recapping some concepts. So we can do this briefly. The Red Queen hypothesis. What, does anybody remember what topic we were talking about when this came up? <laughs> 
Has anybody started studying yet? Yeah, so the concept, we, we, that was the arms race day. And the scenario was the point of the Red Queen story from Alice in Wonderland was it was about running and running and running and running and never getting anywhere, putting a lot of work into some sort of a process but not really getting anything out of it. And that is an example for an example, for example, would be host pathogen interactions. You could think, or you could think of things like bacterial resistance to antibiotics. So you have an antibiotic that's applied to bacteria that selects for bacteria that have mutations that make them resistant. And so if you are a separate bacterial species that produced the antibiotic in the first place, you're not killing your, I don't know, do bacteria have enemies? Mm -hmm. I, sure. Let's say, so there are two species of bacteria. One produces an antibiotic to kill the other species. The other species evolves resistance. So they've both, both of those populations or species have spent energy in some form fighting each other, evolving and then adapting, but they haven't gotten anywhere. They're still at a standstill. Neither is able to win the war against the other species. So what happens next? The first species maybe evolves a new antibiotic that initially kills some of the members of the other species, but eventually they evolve resistance to that antibiotic as well, so it's still a standstill. And that's why this is called an arms race, kind of in response to the Cold War era arms races where both sides escalated the weapons that they produced to result in a standoff. Nobody wanted to launch first because they knew the retaliation would come, so there was a lot of effort put into these actions, but Nobody actually gained ground relative to the other species, the other country, et cetera. So Red Queen hypothesis is basically another way to say an arms race. Another question. So by the end of class today, even though this is review of molecular genetics, most of you in here if not all of you have had molecular genetics instruction at some point. And so that's why I asked you to skim the chapter of molecular genetics for class today. We will get more into specific details about mutations next class. So we'll go through some material you might not have heard about before, at least in the depth we'll go through. Because mutations are so critical for evolution, and sometimes we gloss over them when we do genetics classes. But for evolution, of course, how mutations happen is critical critical understanding to have. So in the meantime, I'm going to tell two stories, two evolutionary stories that involve mutations to set us up for the discussion next class for mutations. But because we're moving away from just sort of generically studying natural selection and phylogenetics, I want to start with redefining natural selection and evolution in terms of population genetics. So what's our, hypo, or not hypothesis, what's our definition of evolution to this point? We came to one at some point in the past in class. So these are the requirements for natural selection or for evolution. What does evolution represent? What's, the, what's a good definition of evolution? Okay, so it was something about changing, changing traits over time. Wow, my Monday handwriting is really bad. <laughs> changing traits over time, that's why it's good to have audio recording as well. And what had to, so what had to be true about those changes? They had to do, have what effect on the organism? Okay, so the changes aren't, of course, meant to increase fitness. The changes, the mutations happen randomly. Sometimes they're bad and they get selected against. Sometimes they're good. Those are the ones that are naturally selected for. Or natural. Right. And so these changes have to increase fitness to be <coughs> dubbed evolved by natural selection. And they have to be heritable. 
which is already in the list over here. So heritable changes that occur over time that increase the fitness of an individual's lineage, of a population. Okay, so I think, yep, is everybody comfortable with that definition and how it incorporates those three requirements? It has to be a genetic basis, that's the heritability part. It has to be a variant, a new version of a gene and that new version, when inherited, has to enhance the reproduction or otherwise the fitness of offspring. So that's a suitable definition to start discussing natural selection. But Here are two different versions of the same story. I'd like you to figure out which one better represents that definition of evolution. This may or may not be a trick question. So on the left are a few phenotypes that you and I can measure for, each, for ourselves, whether or not we have wet or dry earwax. Some of you who have been in my genetics class have heard about this before. So there's a single gene it's called ABCC11, but you don't need to know that particularly. There's a single gene in our genome where a single point mutation, you either have an A nucleotide or a G nucleotide at that spot in that gene. If you have an A, you produce dry earwax. If you have a G, you produce wet earwax. So I only use this because it's a simple example of how a single mutation can cause a change in a trait. So this is a fact. You have an A in this gene, you produce dry earwax. You have a G, you produce wet earwax. Then we have this other fact from a published study that shows, so on the right here are pie charts that represent the frequencies of those two alleles. The A that produces dry earwax, that's the black part. So if you saw something like this, the black shading represents the A allele, and the white shading represents the G allele. So you can look around the world, and you can see in different populations around the world what's the likelihood that you have dry or wet earwax. And it turns out having dry earwax is more common in the east, where you see pie charts that are mostly white. Which of these better represents evolution? What, how would you describe what or how evolution is working based on these two facts? Is it even possible? Pardon? Is it even possible is to describe how evolution is working in this example? So why would there be, is there a fitness benefit? So the question is, is it possible even to describe how evolution works here? So maybe we should go through all of the different requirements for natural selection. So is it heritable? <laughs> yes, it's got a genetic basis, so parents can pass the traits that they have to their kids. Does it cause differential reproductive success? Can you imagine a social scenario where your earwax type might cause you not to be able to have offspring? <laughs> no. A sign of weakness, of its smell, yeah. So the story, and some of you, pro again, will remember this. The story is that this mutation also accompanies potentially, this is not proven necessarily, accompanies a difference in your propensity to sweat. So the thought is that this mutation not only changes your earwax type, but also how much or, let's just say how much you sweat. I don't know if it's related to pore size, but it sounds like it would be. So similar, not necessarily this mutation, but it sounds like that would be a parallel adaptation to living in hot or cold environments, pore size, how much you sweat. 
So the, the story that these authors of this study told was that they think, they hypothesize, that dry earwax is more common in colder environments and wet earwax in hotter environments as an adaptation to, adaptation to climate. You want to sweat more in hotter environments. You don't want to sweat more in colder environments. And that's why we see these patterns. And if that's true, maybe there is some differential reproductive success. There could be a fitness benefit to having the right earwax type in the right climate. So say you're a single individual on the left. You were the first human to invent, to have randomly occur, a mutation that causes dry earwax. Say 100% of the people had always had, every human on the planet always had a G and always produced wet earwax. And the first mutation occurs, and you get one individual that produces dry earwax. Does that count as evolution? Well, let's debate. Is that evolution? So the point here was that's just one individual. Doesn't evolution have to work on a population? It could be the start of evolution. It could be the start of evolution. So what happens in the next generation would be a good question to ask. So does this individual have offspring? Could it propagate? Could it propagate? Right. So you want to look one generation, two generations, 10 generations, 100 generations, 1,000 generations down and find out what about this mutation? Right, so is it maintained first? Is it maintained in the population? This is why we're introducing this concept today. Second, how would you suggest, what would you suggest, what evidence about the frequency of the gene would suggest natural selection is occurring? So you get one mutation, creates it in one individual. If, you, if that mutation that causes dry earwax is naturally selected, what would you expect the frequency of that allele in the population to be later? The same? Okay. You expect the frequency of that mutation to increase. You'd expect more people to have it if it's been naturally selected. So that maybe lets us revise our definition of evolution and natural selection a little bit. That evolution is the change in frequency of an allele over time. in a population. Because of course, within an individual, allele frequencies don't change. You're born with your allele frequencies, you die with them. That's it. So this involves, it implies that we're talking about a group of individuals. So at some point, and that's why we're in the chapter right now of molecular genetics, what are alleles, how do we measure them, and then most importantly, how do we measure their change in frequency over time? That's how we can try to identify and prove that cases of evolution are occurring. Can we monitor a population over time and watch the frequencies of mutations change? What will happen if mutations of detrimental mutation? It's generated, that mutation, happens at random, So it gets selected against, so its frequency plummets over time, not necessarily immediately, but eventually something that's selected against goes to a frequency of zero. If the mutation is beneficial to everybody, then the frequency of that mutation over time in the population, everybody's got this mutation. So you always start out with a small frequency. If it increases over time to 100%, then that looks like beneficial mutation. And if it starts and doesn't go anywhere and then goes to zero, or it starts and it climbs, but then it goes to zero, those could be evidence for deleterious mutations. <coughs> 
bad mutations. So from here on out, we're going to be talking about measuring allele frequencies in a population and seeing what they do. That's the sort of the long-term view. Any questions about this? Any questions about my handwriting? Uh oh. I don't like hearing giggles when I talk about my handwriting. Okay, so there you go. So evolution is a process that occurs over long periods of time in populations, not individuals, and it's a change in frequency of mutations. So this is, again, to reiterate why next class I'd like you to read the, specifically the section of this chapter on mutation. And I asked you to skim the whole chapter this time. Next class when we come back, I'm not done yet. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to remind you, so next class, that's we're talking about mutations, how mutations arise, what they are, how they occur. And then eventually we get to the population genetics chapter, which talks about measuring allele frequencies over time. OK. So that's setting us up for where we're going. And then as I told you at the start of class, for some reason I thought it was interesting to tell these two stories about evolution. And, and they fit the theme and the pattern that we're covering topics in. I want to go back a little bit to the long-term evolution experiment of Rich Lenski. That was the one where he grew a bunch of different populations of bacteria at the same time in the same media and saw that some of those cultures changed in fitness over time. And the conclusion, one of the conclusions was that sometimes you only get evolution after you get a series of mutations that all together give you a fitness boost. So any one mutation by itself does nothing for you. It neither increases nor decreases your fitness. And then if you get all three of these, for example, you get the fitness increase. And that's called, each of those mutations then would be something we call a neutral mutation because they're neutral in terms of your fitness. They don't increase it, they don't decrease it. It doesn't matter to your health whether or not you have that mutation or not. So this is a problem with natural selection and one that a lot of people use to argue about whether or not natural selection, including scientists, argue whether natural selection can actually explain a lot of the variation and adaptation we see in nature. How is it possible that all of this variation has occurred given, for example, this one issue? Sometimes you might have to wait a really long time to get that combination of mutations that will help you adapt. So what if you're dealt the bad hand of poker? What do you do? What does your population do in that case? And there are examples of how these sorts of combinations of bad hands of genes have occurred in nature. And that's the basis of at least the first story I'm going to tell today. Now we're going to get really abstract. So, time to wake up, do a little stretch if you need to, get the neurons firing, briefly. What this represents is what evolutionary biologists refer to as a fitness landscape. Something about this plot tells you about the fitness of an organism. And here, the fitness is plotted on the z-axis. So you can imagine that this z-axis, up and down, is a measure of, let's, let's see, what's the scale? Well, I don't know. I was going to say, let's call it the number of offspring you produce. Although you know you can't have negative offspring, but we'll go with it anyway. It's a good, it's a good way to think about the z-axis. It's some measure of fitness. And then the x and the y-axis, let's call this representing the sequences of two different proteins, protein Y and protein X. 
And we're talking about a specific, each of these axes is a specific amino acid. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, say seven different possible amino acids that could be present at one spot in this protein. So say it's arbitrarily position 328. So amino acid 328 in protein Y. Which amino acid is there? What we're plotting then is, depending on which amino acid is at that spot in that protein, how does that affect your fitness? Is that okay? We've got variants plotted on the X and the Y axes. Genes cause different amino acids to be encoded by this protein, and whatever the amino acid in the protein is causes your fitness to be what's plotted there. And the same is true for protein X. So a different position in that protein, amino acid 27, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different amino acids you could have at that position, depending on which one you have, your fitness changes. So which combination of amino acids do you not want to have? Zero and negative two. Right, so you don't want to be there. So in protein 27, you don't want to have amino acid, whatever amino acid is plotted at point zero. And you definitely don't want to have that in combination with amino acid minus 2 for protein Y. That combination gives you the lowest fitness possible. Is amino acid 0 here in protein X at position 27, is that a bad mutation? Is it a horrible, no good, very bad thing to have that amino acid there? Well, isn't it, isn't it in relation to protein Y? Like, if we're looking at those of them in combination, right? Exactly. So, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that protein X is bad so maybe, so maybe, So maybe alone it's a neutral? Right. So what's, what's the coordinate, X and Y coordinate of that global peak? It's zero something. 0 minus 2, maybe. 0, 2. Let's say. So it's not necessarily that mutation in protein X, or sorry, amino acid 0, say it's glycine, who cares. Say it's bad only when you have a certain amino acid in another protein. So that combination is detrimental. But there's a better place to be on this plot. You really want to be at 0, 2, where you've got maximal fitness. And you've got amino acid 0 in protein X together with amino acid 2 in protein Y. And this is not just hypothetical. I know you're thinking, holy crap, who made this up? These interactions really do exist. There are combinations of proteins where, depending on the amino acid that's in one protein, you want to have a different amino acid in a related protein. But maybe those proteins fit together to produce a biochemical reaction. And so you need the two proteins to functionally and efficiently work together. So this sort of thing does actually happen. The question is, say you are an organism that's right here, this red dot that I'm putting in the minus three, minus three spot of the chart. So you've got those two amino acids in these two proteins, minus three and minus three. They, you're, that's your population. Everybody in the population has that combination of mutations. Now let time start progressing. The organisms reproduce. Random mutations happen. What's going to happen to this population over time as random mutations to these proteins occur? Which direction are we going to move on this landscape, this population? We take little steps. We sort of wander back and forth. What happens when the population's at that spot? It's climbing up. By natural selection, a random mutation happens. If it increases the fitness, as it's doing now, we're climbing up a fitness peak. What has to happen from this point in this population? Yes. 
Ooh. You have more than one. So you, at this point, there are individuals in the population that have this particular combination, whatever numerical combination that is. What happens if one of those individuals that's at this spot right there gets the mutation that pops it over to amino acid zero in protein X? It's fitness drops. That's not what natural selection does. Natural selection always selects for variants that increase your fitness. So what will we see in this population as time progresses? Any individual that climbs down the mountain goes extinct, or their lineage goes extinct, because they've made, they happen to contain mutations that make their fitness worse. So from this point, any mutations that go in either of those two directions decrease fitness of the population, they go extinct. So where does this red population have to go once it started climbing up the mountain? New mutations will happen, but only mutations that increase fitness will stick around. They'll be naturally selected for. <coughs> so the population wanders over, population, over generations. The genotypes of this population change, but they only change to increase their fitness. That's what natural selection is all about. Random mutations happen. <coughs> and the ones, the alleles, the mutations, that are kept in the population are the ones that make your fitness go up. So you'll never, you should never, theoretically, see a population with mutations that actually decrease their fitness. Those mutations, those alleles, should never increase in frequency because they're bad for the population. How would that happen? The issue is, when you're at the top of the peak, as it shows here, this is a local maximum. This is kind of good fitness, but is it the best fitness on this plot that you can get? Is there a fitter combination of mutations? Yeah. Right, there is. How do you get there from here? You're a population that has a particular, right, this is Lenski's long-term evolution experiment, the bad hand of poker. Your historical past, the lineage that's produced your current population, has led you up a tiny little fitness peak. You're relatively OK in terms of fitness. But there's some place, there's a, a particular combination of amino acids in the two proteins that would give you a heck of a lot better fitness. Is this the idea where like, um, some of the population starts to accumulate some uh, neutral mutations, and then all of a sudden it gets a mutation that's actually beneficial for all those neutral mutations? Does that come together and like, get it to the global? So this is an excellent point. The question is, is this where those neutral mutations that don't affect fitness start occurring? The problem is that we're on a fitness peak. So any one mutation, when you're at the top of the peak, moves you ever so slightly off the peak, which is down, which is not a mutation that would then be kept in the population. It would be eliminated from the population as soon as it arises because it's detrimental. So once you arrive at a peak, how do you move to a different peak? So this is hypothetical, I understand, and a bit dry, <laughs> if not more. The issue is that we see populations, there are empirical data that suggest that populations do go from local peaks to maximum peaks. This set off a huge, and this is a debate that still rages in evolution, although maybe a little bit less so than a century or half a century ago. This is the question. Does evolution occur like I drew it by a series of tiny, well, mutations, but mutations that make discrete, tiny little changes in fitness over time? So that's the many mutations of small effect hypothesis. So mutation is very, evolution is very gradual. It occurs over long periods of time with individual mutations, each of which by itself makes a tiny improvement to your fitness. And over time, that produces a big effect. So that would be an example of what I drew there. Lots of little changes over time. So that's many mutations of small effect. What's the opposite? One mutation of large effect. So is it possible that once your population finds itself on a peak, 
you could get one mutational event, a single change at one point in time that jumps you from peak to peak. So it, the, in other words, the question is, do the changes on this fitness landscape always have to be incremental? Do they always have to be small little steps that barely improve your fitness? Or can there be cases in evolution where all of a sudden that magical mutation happens, the right one or the right combination, all at the same time, that jumps you from peak to peak? Are there some that argue that it's a little of both? And of course, this is not a binary discussion, so it's possible that both occur. And it's very likely, of course, that both occur in natural selection when we're talking about all the species on the planet, right? So what the real debate is, and thank you for asking that question, the real, real debate at this point in time in evolution is the relative amount, the relative contribution of those, both of these approaches to evolution in natural populations. Is it usually mutations of small effect, but rarely mutations of large effect? Or might it be that most traits that are adaptive occur because those single magical mutations that leap you from fitness peak to fitness peak occur. So that's the theoretical setup for the story I'm going to tell you now. Talking about wars, I guess we can talk about defense systems. So three-spined stickleback fish are tiny little fish that are found all over the northern hemisphere of the planet. <clears throat> They're adults maybe three or four inches long. They're found in marine environments, and they're found in freshwater environments. And a couple of decades or more ago, it was shown that, sorry, let me change the thickness of the pen here. Marine fish, so if you go out in the ocean and you catch sticklebacks, you find sticklebacks that have both a pelvis, that's this structure, that produces two bony spines. And when three-spine sticklebacks attack, it sticks those spines straight out, which makes it difficult for bigger predators to actually bite and swallow the fish. They also stick the spines up on their backs, straight up like this. So they make like this little triangle of mouth damaging peril for salmon and trout and other things. So normally when they're swimming around, their spines are all laid back and their dorsal spines and their pelvic spines, so dorsal spines, pelvic spines are retracted. But when they get attacked, they stick them out. But then there are a bunch of freshwater lakes where scientists started going into the lakes and collecting sticklebacks, same species. But notice that what's changed? When you stain these fish with the dye called alizarin red, which stains those bony structures, not only do those fish in freshwater environments not have those armored plates, these are bony plates that presumably also protect the stickleback from bites. So predators try to bite them, but they hit armor, not flesh. These freshwater fish don't have those bony plates, and they don't have those pelvic spines. So please tell me, why do you think, is this natural selection? <laughs> is this change from an ancestor. We know the ancestors of these fish came from marine environments. So this is the ancestral trait. Plates and pelvic spines are ancestral traits. The freshwater populations are derived. So these freshwater populations that live in lakes and streams along the west coast showed up relatively recently in geological time. They all had marine ancestors. So could this be natural selection, or could it just be chance? So if it's natural selection, what story would you tell about why these species have lost their armor? They've lost their defenses against predators. OK, so maybe there's a change in the type of predator, the number of predator in the freshwater environments from the marine environments. So there could actually be, so, what's, so there must be a trade-off. Metabolic cost. So it could be metabolic cost. So it might be expensive biochemically to produce those, that armor and the pelvis and the pelvic spines. So there could be a trade-off there. If you don't need the armor, why use the energy to produce the armor? So these are all hypotheses that have been tested recently 
using the stickleback. So this is exactly what the stickleback biologists thought might have been going on, that freshwater lakes were colonized by marine ancestors, but over time, natural selection got rid of, by having mutations, got rid of the gene or genes that produce these bony plates. The thing is, this has happened over and over and over and over and over again in independent lakes and streams along the West Coast. And that was what was really interesting to the evolutionary biologists, because this is parallel evolution. There are tens, at least, of populations of this species of fish that have independently lost their armored plates and their pelvic spines. What's the probability? that the same trait evolves so many times, literally tens of times, along just the west coast of North America. What does that suggest about the type of mutations that are occurring that are changing in frequency and populations over time? They're beneficial. How many mutations does it probably take to make this change? Small number versus not large number. If it happens repeatedly, it's maybe likely that it's very easy to evolve this trait, loss of spines. So this is the abstract from this paper, and I'm just circling a really important point here. They wanted to know what was the genetic basis of the evolution of this trait over and over again in these different populations of fish. How did, and this was something I didn't tell you yet, this happened relatively recently in time, around the last 10,000 years or so. So not very many generations of stickleback populations. Right? Not many parent to kid to grandkid to great grandkid and so forth. And there's not much time here for these mutations to have occurred by chance in all of these different populations. So even if it was just one mutation that causes loss of armor plates, even that's all it takes, is just one mutation in one individual to lose armor plates, what's the chance that in that short period of time, 10,000 years, 10,000 generations or so, that in 10 or more populations of sticklebacks, that same random mutation happened in all of those populations? It should be pretty low, but that's not what we observe. We observe the same trait evolve in all of these different populations. So what these scientists concluded, and I'll show you a little bit more detail in a second, is what's circled up here, that in the marine fish, there were individuals that did not have plates. So that mutation that was beneficial in freshwater already existed. It didn't have to arise from scratch. That random mutation didn't have to happen in all 20 of these freshwater populations. What happened was that every time those marine ancestor fish got trapped in a freshwater lake, maybe a handful, a couple, maybe one individual, brought that, anset, that ancient mutation that causes platelessness with it into that lake. And that presumably explains why all of these populations of sticklebacks were able to evolve the same trait so quickly. It's not that they each independently had that same mutation happen. They all brought it with them from their ancestors. So even today, when you go out into the ocean, you can find that there are very few individuals in the ocean that somehow manage to survive even though they don't make those armored plates. That mutation exists out in the ocean. It's being selected against, for sure, because 99.9% .9 of the fish you find in marine environments do have that armor. But even just a tiny little bit of, I don't know, I suppose I should hesitate to call it genetic contamination. That sounds kind of not appropriate to say, but I just did, and now it's recorded, so. <laughs> There's a little bit of genetic differentiation in that marine population. And so that's helpful for these populations when they get stuck in fresh water. So this is just another example. I should have shown this to you earlier. This is what happens when it's late on Sunday and I'm putting together a lecture. So this, for example, is from a different paper, but showing three different populations of stickleback fish from three different individual freshwater lakes in Alaska. These lakes are not connected to each other. But all of these fish share that same trait. 
They don't have the pelvic spines. They don't have the armor plates. Sure. Or yeah. So, are there predators in these freshwater lakes? What are the predators? We get to in a second. But excellent question. Yeah. So, what's what? How have these species adapted to life in freshwater aside from losing their armor? So, how would you answer th these questions? So, could you come up with a hypothesis for how? A species of fish would not produce bony plates. That, that has nothing to do with genetics. Is there another explanation for this pattern that we see? Mm -hmm. Lots of freshwater. When you move a fish into freshwater, it doesn't make plates. A lack of DNA Absolutely. So what chemicals does it take to produce the calcium in this case? What chemicals are needed to make those plates, and are they available in the environment they find themselves in? So is there a difference in dissolved calcium in freshwater versus marine water? Yes. So the evolutionary biologists then had to rule out the possibility that this was an environmental, this was not an environmental change. It was a genetic change that causes this difference in traits. So what would you do? How do you test that sort of a hypothesis or concern? Sure. So take some fish, put them in low calcium water, high calcium water. We've done this before in class. What's that called? We're going to make a plot. When you change an environmental condition and you want to know if a trait is genetic or not. This is review for the exam. This is a norm of reaction plot. If you want to know if a trait is controlled by genes or the environment, you change the environment and you look at the plot and see whether or not what you're measuring has changed based on a change in environment. So scientists are actually doing this right now. There are scientists at University of British Columbia that have built these huge, huge, literally probably the size of this room and maybe about as deep as the chair rail up here, maybe deeper, ponds. They're experimental ponds. They're on the University of British Columbia campus. And they can either, if they want to, I suppose, change the amount of dissolved calcium in the water. That's not what they do, but they theoretically could. What they've done in that case is they've changed, they put marine stickleback, they put freshwater stickleback. What they want to know is, are those fish able to defend themselves against different types of predators? So they have a number of these huge ponds, they throw some sticklebacks in, and then they stock the ponds with predators that are native to the marine environment and the ancestral environment. And they want to know after a year, they just leave them alone. They throw the fish in. They throw some predators in that they've collected in the wild from native habitats. They throw the predators in. Then a year later, maybe, they go snorkeling in the ponds. And they pull out some sticklebacks. And they want to find out who survived. So which fish survived the different types of predators or different types of water conditions best, plated or plateless? And it's unclear to me still whether this is a story or if this is fact, but this is at least an interesting story to tell. Why did the sticklebacks lose their pelvic spines? One hypothesis is that this happens. This is true. So dragonfly larvae predate three-spine stickleback and many other fish species larvae. So when they're larval sticklebacks, they're pretty easy to catch. And they're easier to catch if they've got pelvic spines. The dragonfly larvae can grab onto their pelvic spines, which is exactly what's happening in this picture. So is there evolutionary pressure to lose pelvic spines in an environment where there are dragonfly larvae? You bet, because if you've got spines, you're more likely to be killed. But in ocean, the main predators are the giant fish salmon, <coughs> trout, and so forth, that will actually try to eat the sticklebacks, whereas the armor and the spines are beneficial. They deter predation. 
So at this point, presumably, it is natural selection. And these experiments where they've put fish in these huge experimental ponds have shown that you can evolve these traits rapidly and watch it occur based on change in predation from the marine environment to the freshwater environment. So in, this, in sum, and we're done, there was no magic combination of multiple mutations that were required to get a population from what looks like a marine fish to what looks like a freshwater, unplated, spineless fish. That combination of mutations already existed in the marine environment. It was just quickly selected for in multiple environments when those fish invaded freshwater habitats. When we come back together in time, I may or may not tell you about the next story, but for next. class. Do re-skim if you need to, especially chapters 6.3 and 6.4, variation and mutation. We'll get back into the molecular genetics.